Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Douglas E. Welch. I've been talking to you all ahead of time, so you already know that. But for the tape, it's uh, Douglas E. Welch, and today is stay in control of your RSS feed. Why do you stay in control of your RSS feed? Well, as someone who started podcasting two weeks after the before this guy, uh, <laughs> two weeks after the uh, term was coined, um, I didn't have a lot of options when I started up. Um, and so I have, even to this day, got caught up a little bit in that I am not in perfect control of my RSS feed. Now, I am lucky in the standpoint that the services I do use probably aren't going to go away anytime soon, uh, but it still is a little disconcerting sometimes uh, when those services have a bit of a hiccup or there's some issue where things aren't working quite as right. Your RSS feed is akin to your phone number, your mailing address, uh, your email address. If you've ever had to change one of those, you know what a pain it is to have to change your RSS feed, except that the RSS feed brings something even worse along with that, which is you tend to lose about a third to a half of your subscribers to your podcast if you change your RSS feed. Now, they'll come back, um, but as you know, not, people are not always the most technical, technically savvy, and so when you change that feed and, you're, and you have to ask someone to subscribe to a new feed, it can get a little hairy sometimes. So we're going to talk about some ways of, of kind of automatically moving them over to a new feed and basically getting control of your feed so that should you ever have to do this, uh, hopefully you won't, but should you ever have to do this, you have some guidelines as to how to do it in the best way possible. Um, to go back to my beginning story, 2004, September 2004, I started podcasting. I had a blogger blog. Blogger does not produce a podcast-ready RSS feed. And so I had very few options at the time. Um, what I did was I took Adam Curry's <laughs> RSS feed, <laughs> downloaded it, brought it up in a text editor, edited in whatever I wanted to do, and I hand-created my RSS feed every time I released a show. RSS is picky. Mess up the date or the time by one letter, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so it got to be a real pain. You know, I'd, I'd go to check, the, I'd, you know, validate the RSS like. I'm sorry, I got validation error, but it's just a real pain in the butt to have to do that. Even copying and pasting every week, it got to be a real pain in the butt. So when FeedBurner came along, how many people are familiar with FeedBurner? Yeah, so when FeedBurner came along, it's like, oh, thank God. it was like manna from heaven. I didn't have to, uh, you know, hand it at my feed anymore. The trouble was, I was on a Microsoft IIS web server. Well, one of the features that ISS severely lacks is any sort of redirection. So the only thing I could do is give iTunes and all my subscribers my new feed burner feed. And I did actually have to tell them in the show and in the blog, hey, we're going to change over our feed. Please change your feed. And to this day, I still have 100 or so hits a day on the old RSS feed. You know, there's still some, some thing out there that never got, the, never got the letter to switch over to the new feed. Um, so... In iTunes and in most people's browsers, they don't have any sort of RSS address that points to me. They point to the service, FeedBurner. Well, as I said, FeedBurner got purchased by Google, probably not going away anytime soon, but they've had issues every once in a while. I've had issues with them. I had a plugin on my WordPress blog because I did eventually upgrade to WordPress. Uh, I had a plugin that was causing it, the RSS feed to be kind of slow in, in uh, calculating and FeedBurner was timing out. So all of a sudden, none of my podcasts were going out because FeedBurner says, no, there's nothing new. I'm sorry, you don't have a feed because it couldn't get it quickly enough. They're really, they have a really short timeout <laughs> on, their, on their feed grabber. Um, so you run into issues like that that perhaps uh, you don't really want to face. Uh, we were dealing earlier with uh, the gentleman here. Your name, I'm sorry. Patrick, Patrick who was uh, you know, talking about he used rapid feeds and he's having some issues in it updating correctly. So he's in the process right now of doing what, what I'm talking about, which is, kind of figuring out, am I going to move people over? Doing it right the first time saves you a lot of the pain that I have gone through and that I will continue to go through until I basically stop using all these third-party services or uh, do it in such a way that people have my address rather than some third-party address. And that's the goal for whatever you're doing. Rule one, get it right the first time. Uh, you don't want to change your RSS. In some cases, it can get really bad and a service will simply disappear and you will have no way to reach your listeners, especially podcasters who perhaps, you know, only a fraction of them actually read the blog. They're subscribed to the podcast, and that's all they really get. Well, if they can't get your next audio, they can't know you've changed, and you just kind of 
you disappear into the ether uh, unless they do some sort of search or actually go to the blog and check you out. You can also use, there's also a thing we talked about, you know, using uh, Feedburn and stuff like that. You can also, you can still hand code your RSS, but there's easier ways to do it. There's, ser there's online services like Podcast Blaster allow you to basically type in the information for each show, and then it spits out an RSS feed. There's a program called Feeder for the Mac that you can, you know, basically type in what you want the RSS thing, and it'll spit out an RSS file for you. I, I don't recommend it. If most these days, we're all using blogs to release our podcast. They all produce RSS. Make it easy on yourself. <laughs> Use the RSS uh, that's given to you. Uh, rule number two, make the RSS transparent to your subscribers. So do as I say, not as I do. The goal is when you first set up your blog, your blog and your podcast, you don't want to be giving anyone, even if you're using FeedBurner or some other service, you don't want to be giving people that address. You want to be giving them something like, you know, you know, if I had my druthers, the feed for my career opportunities podcast would be something like, God, I'm going to run on the board here, <laughs> um, feed, for example. That would be the best possible solution for any podcast because guess what? You control that address. You control that feed. You can point that feed anywhere. It's totally under control because you can use a variety of ways of doing that. Even, say you're using FeedBurner like I am. I can simply make this a redirect. Use, if, you have, if you're using an Apache web server, which thank goodness most of us are these days, you can redirect this address anywhere. And you can do it in several ways. You can do it via what's called a, uh, an HT access file, which is a kind of a little tricky, but you'll find many, many solutions online for using HT access. Or you can simply do um, a PHP redirect. Uh, PHP, as you know, is a powerful built-in programming language that basically allows you to say the same thing, but you put it inside of a file. You put it inside your index file that sits in that directory and says, uh, yeah, uh, the feed's over there. <laughs> and it basically points out to FeedBurner or some other place. Uh, if you are using FeedBurner and you are using WordPress, one kind of m m minor step up that I've made in my blogs <coughs> is there's a, a plugin for WordPress called FeedSmith, which allows you, without dealing with HD access, without dealing with PHP at all, you basically put the plugin in and it says, what's your feed burner feed? Do it. And it takes all the default feeds that WordPress provides you, you know, that uh, wp-rss2.php, basically anywhere there's a feed in your theme, it redirects it to, transparently to the feed burner feed. And so getting started, if people decide they want to use FeedBurner, I say, if you're going to use FeedBurner, put this in. Give everyone the typical uh, WordPress feed address so that, again, it's still under your control, and let the plugin direct it out to where you want it. The nice thing is, is at any time, you can say, I'm not going to use FeedBurner anymore, and you just turn off that redirect. What was the plugin? FeedSmith. And it was actually produced by the FeedBurner people uh, Google still supports it. it Google's kind of, they, they, they bought FeedBurner, but they haven't done a lot with it, except for the part that they really wanted, which is they want it for an advertising base. So they've really worked hard to integrate it with AdSense. But other features of it have kind of like, <laughs> which is why I'm thinking of trying to get off of it and, and move on. Um, if you're interested in the PHP to do the redirect, let me know. I have the actual little code snippet. It's really straightforward. Uh, yes? Will that be online somewhere? Uh, yeah, well, I, here. <laughs> there it is right there. <laughs> I don't have my computer plugged in because I really don't have any slides or anything. Okay. But if you just do, a, just do a search, actually, a Google search on PHP redirect, and you'll find the code. But the only option is to put in the location. You say, where is it going to redirect? Um, you may or may not know, but with any website, if you name a file index, index.php, index.html, that's the default file that loads. And so you would put it in this directory and just call it index.php, and it would just see it and pick it right up. OK. FeedSmith we talked about for if, you're, if you are using FeedBurner. Now, FeedBurner, as I said, was a godsend for me because FeedBurner takes a plain Jane blogger atom feed. It's not even an RSS feed. It's an atom feed. It's similar but different. And it doctors it up and turns it into a nice, friendly, actually browser-friendly and all this stuff, uh, podcast feed. 
It does that by looking at the feed, and whenever it sees a link to a media file, MP3, MOV, M4V, PDF, it basically grabs that and makes the enclosure line in that RSS 2.0 file so that iTunes and other podcatchers can basically see it and go, oh, let me get that, and they download it automatically. Um, you'll see in my uh, blogs, oftentimes, especially if I have a video, there'll be a one-touch player there, and right underneath it will say iPod Ready Video. Well, that's for if people wanted to click on it, they can get it, but really, that line, that link is specifically there for FeedBurner. Because FeedBurner sees that, scoops up the video, out it goes in my feed, people get it automatically who are subscribed. Now, the other issue you can run into, and rule number three is, decide all of this before you submit your show to iTunes. Because the fact is, if you don't have to change where iTunes is looking, you're better off. <laughs> okay? if you, I had to do this for a client recently, and it works, but you can get in a situation, much like the gentleman here, where telling iTunes to look somewhere else may not be possible. Okay? So you want to try and have all this stuff established before you ever submit your show to iTunes. And that's just a good general advice. Uh, because iTunes, um, for example, if you submit your podcast before it has any podcast in it, iTunes will sometimes reject it. Uh, if, it if your artwork isn't 300 by 300 by 72, iTunes will sometimes you know, <laughs> cough at you and not, not accept your podcast. So this is just part of getting everything neat and ready before you send it up. The other thing, of course, is in um, your feed, you need these iTunes-specific tags. Well, in my case, FeedBurner does that for me. There's a section in FeedBurner where I, <laughs> where I set the, uh, the category and the artwork and the description of my podcast and all that. And that's your only interface into the iTunes store for your podcast is your RSS file. And if you submitted a plain chain RSS, that's all you're going to get in iTunes is a very, very plain chain listing. Where if you submit an RSS with all the nice iTunes tags in it, it's going to pull all that up and make a nice entry in your show. Um, if you need, um, if for example you submitted an RSS feed to iTunes, for example, I had a client who was using uh, one of the web services called Podcast Blaster. Literally, all it is is you type or cut and paste the RSS information in, and it spits out a RSS file that you can then submit somewhere. The trouble is, um, through some basic internal corporate uh, shenanigans, they weren't using that anymore. So the person was posting through the blog and posting shows, and nothing was showing up in the iTunes feed because, of course, it was looking at a feed that wasn't being updated any longer. So I had to tell iTunes to look elsewhere for a, the feed information for this blog. So I said, well, first of all, let's get this third-party thing out of the way. We don't need it anymore. We can use WordPress and a plugin to basically generate a nice new iTunes feed for you. But how do we tell iTunes to look somewhere else? Well, the fact is, there is an iTunes directive that you can put in an RSS file. New feed dash feed dash URL. Yeah. You put the new feed address in here. And I think, I don't actually have the ending tag for that. I think there is an ending tag, maybe. Um, now, the course, if you want to put this in your RSS feed, guess what? You have to be able to control your RSS feed. Well, in my case, I simply replaced the file that they had been using on their website with a file that contained nothing but that line and a pointer to the new site. Now, this is great for you because basically anyone who subscribed with iTunes will now see the new feed iTunes will also look at the new feed and pull new artwork, new description, new category, everything that may be updated in that. Some cases, though, like we're dealing with rapid feeds here, we can't find a place in their service to allow us to do that. Now, if you can't find a way to somehow feed this thing to iTunes, guess what? Your show's dead. You're going to have to resubmit to the iTunes podcast directory a new show with a new correct RSS feed and, let it, and basically start over. Your subscribers will have lost you. Uh, again, goes back to the earlier rules. Try and have this stuff set up beforehand. And I'm, basically, I'm telling you this thing because I've gone through all this stuff. <laughs> and I would prefer that you don't. Um, once you do do this, I did this for a client and it worked really well. Within about 10 minutes, it picked up the new feed, 
which I could tell because, of course, I had, we had changed the description, we had changed the artwork a little bit, we changed stuff in it, and it had different shows in there, and just you know, recheck, 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 boom, all of a sudden, it's got a new feed. And the nice thing was it kept all of their subscribers, because their subscribers were subscribed to, I, you know, in iTunes, and if they see that redirect, it's like, okay, no problem, I'll look over here now. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds there. You don't lose all your subscribers in doing that. But just to reinforce, if you don't have control over that file, you're in danger because you may, your subscribers just may be off in the ether somewhere. And if you have no way of talking to them except through your audio files, you're going to run into trouble because they'll never find out unless they read your blog or something like that. Which is another good reason, too, if you can get an email list of your subscribers and kind of cul cultivate that. It's a good idea in case you ever have anything that happens like this. Now, for WordPress again, what I recommend for people nowadays when they're first starting up podcasting, I typically recommend that they install WordPress. It's just, one, it's fairly easy to set up, even the self-installed. Two, it's very, very feature rich for a lot of things, not just podcasting. There's, there's a lot of features you can add to WordPress. There's a lot of different themes you can get for WordPress. And finally, for podcasting, you can get one of our sponsors, <laughs> uh, plugins, <laughs> reinforce, give a little sponsor love here. You can get uh, the um, Blueberry PowerPress. Now, PowerPress is a rewrite of an earlier plugin called PodPress, which you may still run into. In fact, I, for my client, I couldn't quite get PowerPress working because I didn't have full control over the, the web server. Uh, and we fell back to PodPress, which still works. Uh, PowerPress is a little, it's neatened up. It has a few more options. But what's nice about PowerPress is when you add this to WordPress, PowerPress has places where you go in and you set up all your iTunes specific tags, your artwork, your description, your titles, your categories, and so on and so forth, all within WordPress. You don't have to use any third party uh, services like Feedburn or anything else. You, it's totally under your control. And that's another big reason I push people to WordPress is right off the bat, everything stays in your hands. And had I been able to do this when I started, I would have done this. <laughs> the fact is, five years ago, WordPress didn't exist. Right? <laughs> right? Am, I, am I correct? Yeah, WordPress did not exist five years ago. Uh, Blogger was basically the only hosted blogging service you could find. I think TypePad came along and some others, and then WordPress finally. Um, so again, if you're just getting started or you're thinking of upgrading your podcast and your everything, Think about WordPress. Think about the PowerPress plugin. But if I use the PowerPress, do I still need the FeedSmith or not? Yes, because they do different things. Well, not, not, not really, no. FeedSmith is if you're using FeedBurner. The fact is, if you have PowerPress, you, have, you have no longer have any need to use FeedBurner because PowerPress replaces what it does for you. Oh, so I can get rid of FeedBurner. Yes, you can get rid of FeedBurner. And what happens in PowerPress is you is one of the settings in PowerPress, and they have a default for it. It says, here's my podcast URL. And you can set that to whatever you want. Um, so that, again, you control that address. And anytime in the future, you can say, oh, you know, I want to point it over there. So then you could, like, say you wanted to use FeedBurner afterwards. Well, you could. You would just uh, use FeedSmith and tell everything to go out there. You know, you can combine these things. In reality, that's... You're probably moving from FeedBurner to a, to a PowerPress situation instead of the other way around. The stats for PowerPress, you know, then you're relying on your own stats. You're relying on your web host stats or you're relying on Google Analytics for your stats, stats here. Don't provide subscribers. Not unless you're a Blueberry subscriber. Uh, and the fact is, I, for, po well, this is a little tangent, but stats for podcasting, very, very important. And really, the only stats that matter to me, and Evo may chime in on this, the only stats that matter to me don't come from any service you're going to use out there, Google Analytics or anything else. The only stats that matter to me are downloads. And the only way to get an accurate count of the number of files downloaded is through raw log files, the actual line-by-line -line files of every file that's accessed on your website. And I have a little shell script that I use that literally parses a file, pulls out all the MP3, counts them all up, and tells me this show had this many, this show had... Cause I have I have one show that I do weekly, then I have like four others that I do occasionally, and it pulls out and says, this had 10, no, no, this had 100, this had 500, whatever. And this is actually a problem with my clients, is there really is no easy way to get good podcasting stats without resorting to a shell script or something like that. 
uh, in the Friends and Tech group, I don't have my badge on, but uh, we're a group of uh, podcasters, and um, we all came out of the Tech Podcast Network, which is part of Blueberry, uh, way back. We actually developed a, a, a script that you ran on your log files because we got paid based on our audience share of the network for our advertising. And so we developed a, uh, a little script that would basically say, very, very conservatively, this is how many downloads you had. Compare that to how many downloads all the shows had, and this is your share. So we actually got paid on this. So it was very important that we got these stats, but it required raw log files. Now, if you're on GoDaddy, you got to pay extra for that. You don't get raw log files by default. You have to upgrade to their traffic facts for like $2.95 a month or something like that, which is a pain. I went without them for like three months, and I just got you know jittery. <laughs> it's like, I got, no, i got to have my raw log files. i got to get those stats. So... In, in, stats, in that regard, stats. You can use Google Analytics in some way. You can actually tag each one of your podcast downloads with a Google Analytics tag, and it will track them. Frankly, I find it to be a pain. It's a, it's a hassle to, to put the tag into all your links. And even to this day, some podcasting clients don't like wrapped download tags. They, they just don't get the redirect. FeedBurner had a redirect that you could use. And you turn it on, and it's like, wait a minute. Now no one's getting my show because it just wouldn't see the show. It couldn't parse its way down the chain. You got a question? Yeah, I was going to say, um, with stats, you're pulling raw log files from your server, so you're hosting files locally. Is it yes. like a CDN or something like that? So. Yeah. Now, if you're hosting on a CDN, um, you know, say for Libsyn, you're, you're going to get stats from them. Although I've heard with them, it's kind of like, yeah, how accurate are these? It's kind of, you know, you are dependent upon the third party to get accurate stats. And one of the weakest things of Libsyn over the years has been their stats reporting. It tends to go up and down. Is it accurate or not? Whatever. Still does. Yeah, I've never used Libsyn, actually. Uh, because my show, I'm in, a, I'm in an enviable position. It's an audio podcast, five to six minutes. So frankly, all my shows are hosted locally. Uh, I prefer that. Um, it means I can basically back up my website, and I've got all my audio, and you know everything's. I have a local copy of everything that's out there. So. God forbid, <laughs> if I have to change again, which is changing web host is, is just abysmal. But if I have to, I can put everything back. And so I like that. Um, with a third party, with any third party, you're kind of rolling the dice. And this is the way I'm with Fever right now. It's like, you're kind of saying, okay, I, I'm betting they're going to be around in another year. Um, and sometimes you may have to face them not being around. So in the back of your mind, you need to be thinking about that. Stats are probably the weakest part of podcasting. With that said, compared to the Nielsen ratings for television, which are complete fiction, <laughs> uh, podcasting tags are actually pretty good. If I can say, I can't say you listen to it, but I can say you downloaded the file. I can say a file got transferred to your computer to the point where you could listen to it. Um, and there's something to be said for that, I think. Uh, now with automatic ad insertion that you're seeing on some of the sites and stuff, they can track, well, that ad got inserted in this show. Um, and that's sort of nice. That's something I lose by hosting my own files, of course, is I, I don't have any ad insertion. I'm not a part of any network. I was for a while. Um, but it was back in the days when we really didn't have intelligent ad. We had to insert the ads. So I still have shows on my site that have ads that are four years old. <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it unless I go in and edit out the ad. So it's kind of funky in that regard. Um, finally, rule number four, if you use external feeds, and I'll explain exactly why you would use those in a minute, cloak them with your own URL. For example, I deal with a lot of people who are just now, after five years, kind of waking up to the whole power of new media. It's been a long, hard slog. You're like dragging people along, but finally you hit that value for them. You hit that point where it's like, oh, you mean I can do? And you're like, yeah, and I can, yeah, and they get it. The trouble is they're not very technically savvy. Um, and so, in some cases, I get them to start out slowly. We start out with a WordPress.com blog, for example, and which is the hosted version of WordPress. It exists on their site. You get a URL, something like newmediainterchange.wordpress.com or something like that. But the fact is, it's free, it's quick, it's dirty, it's still the power of WordPress for a large amount, and um, it's still very effective. The other thing I do for like video bloggers, people who want to become video podcasters, is I really like a site called Blip TV. Um, Blip.tv. Um, I started using it for one reason, but overall, um, they have a couple advantages, especially for podcasting. One is they have no length limit. 
I've uploaded an hour and a half of video, 700 and some megabytes, no problem. They'll take it and they'll serve it out. Uh, they give me my nice one touch player for my website because again, a lot of people are watching from your website, not from your feed. Your, your, your goal is to get them subscribed, but the fact is lots of people don't. They go to your website and they watch it there or they watch it in Google Reader or whatever. Uh, so they give me that nice one touch player, which is so important. The thing that they give me, which some other sites don't do, is they will actually serve up the M4V file, the podcast ready file that I upload to them, they'll serve back out. And in some extreme cases, if people just want to get started, they're not sure if they're going to continue, whatever, you can use Blip TV as your blogging, video blogging engine. Because Blip TV provides a nice RSS 2.0 feed. Podcast ready, carries the enclosure files and everything along with it. Now, if you think back on what I said earlier though, what don't you want to be doing? You don't want to be telling people, oh, here's my feed. Uh, you know, whatever, I think it's your show name, D-E-W, uh, or something like that, right? It works, but you don't want to be giving them that feed because somewhere down the line, you're going to have to try and move them somewhere else. Much better that you do what we, we talked about earlier, which is make a nice, you know, have a very, very simple website with a domain and maybe just a little hosting on it so that you could create something like com slash my show slash RSS or something like that. Forget my handwriting. But then you can point that in the future anywhere. I'm going to move to Vimeo now. Okay, point it to Vimeo. I'm going to move to Fiddler. Okay, point it to Fiddler. I'm going to host them locally. Okay, point it locally. You maintain complete control. Even though you're using these third-party services, you still have complete control over where your subscribers are being directed. Does that make sense? Just to re go over the rules again real quick, get it right the first time. If you have the ability or you're just getting started, do it right the first time. Think about what you're doing now and what you may want to do down the road. It will save you a lot of pain and heartache. Sometime, somewhere, I'm going to have to redirect all my users to another URL. I'm going to have to put a show out there. FeedBurner will help. They actually have a service where you say, where do you want to send them to? And that will get most of them. So I have kind of a little bit of an advantage there, but I'm still going to have to go through the pain of doing it somewhere down the line. Probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to PowerPress and I'm going to bring, bring those feeds local again so I can move forward from there. Number two, make RSS changes transparent to the reader. Have redirects. Have a way that you can change something on your site and your subscribers don't even notice. All of a sudden, they, they just keep getting their show like they always have. You could be pointing to Timbuktu for all they care because if you control it, they don't see anything. They just see shows continuing to come in. They may see the, the artwork change or the description change, but probably not even that. Three, decide all of this before submitting it to iTunes. Because again, iTunes is another little thing. You, you're, in some cases, we, we, we were wondering, and I'm not really sh exactly sure how it's going to react. iTunes, if you redirect your RSS feed somewhere else, iTunes may, may see that new feed and slurp all of its stuff back in without that redirection that we did before. I actually haven't tried it, so I can't say. I'm hoping that it would. I think that it would, but you never quite know in that case. Again, if you can do it before you submit it to iTunes, it's always better. And four, if you use external feeds for any service, Audioboo, uh, Utterly, Blip TV, Vimeo, Viddler, whatever, cloak them. You know, even if it means you're going to pay you know, two bucks a month for a website that does nothing but have your domain and allow you to put a, a redirect file on there, cloak them with your own stuff because I can guarantee you down the road, you're going to want to have control of it. And that said, that's all I have for today. If any questions, please, we'll just open it up. Well, if you, uh, yeah. if you had your perfect world, where <laughs> would you host? your videos, would you host them yourself or would you still keep them on? You know, early on, I hosted them myself. The, the issue being, if you host your files locally, you need that one touch player. And while there are flash players that you can get, you know, a little package and you put it on your website, frankly, I'm a tech person, I have trouble configuring those flash players. They're a little bit of a black art and I finally just said, why am I going through all this trouble? 
Um, why don't you just put them on a third-party site like Blip and let them serve them up? One, it's less load on my web server, which is GoDaddy, which isn't necessarily the speediest, speediest web server in the world. Um, it's storage. You know, eventually, I'm going to run out of storage. Well, if I'm putting up 700 megabyte files, I'm going to run out that much quicker. Um, so I decided, you know, why not use these services? Now, the other advantage you get to that, that actually is an advantage, is every service you put your, web, your videos on is another exposure point to people. Because they're on Blip, people might stumble across them on Blip. They might stumble across them on YouTube. Now, you can't use YouTube for podcasting, but you probably want your videos there. Um, that's a little bit hard for some people to understand sometimes. Like, no, you actually want to put your videos on as many sites as you can get them on. The podcast is to serve the subscribers, the people who are hardcore, you know, said, yes, I want to get every show you produce. The other video sites are for exposing people who don't know anything about you. Uh, my typical phrase I say is you want to give every opportunity for people to stumble upon you. And then, you know, now there's a whole site called Stumble Upon. But you want to expose yourself. And in fact, there's even a great website that I use on occasion. I do some short videos called uh, just they're, they're career tips and new media tips that I do. Not through my podcast, actually, they're actually designed to expose other people to the show who've never heard about it. And um, what was I doing? Where was I going with that? Exposing people. So therefore, what I, I want those to be out there as, I actually don't include them in my podcast, but I do want them on all the other sites to, again, hit people who don't know about me already. TubeMogul.com is a great site, and there are others out there as well. It's free. They have a premium package as well. You upload your video once. You describe it once. You title it once. You tag it once, and it will submit it to like 15 to 20 different video sites. Now, you have to go out and get your credentials on all the sites first. That's, you can't avoid that. You've got to have a login. But once you have a login set up, you upload it here, and you say, launch. And then your computer's freed up. You don't have to worry about it. You can go away. And TubeMogul goes, thump, 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 and just puts it out on all the other sites. Yes? Have they fixed the issue with Viddler and Vimeo yet? No. And it's not their fault, unfortunately. I keep trying to put in my credentials for Vimeo, and Vimeo's like, no. <laughs> yeah, just, Rever hasn't worked in weeks. Well, Rever, Rever, I'm not sure. Have you heard anything? Rever seems to me like it's, it's I, I used to use Rever, and it doesn't seem like anyone's there anymore. <laughs> it's kind of like, hello. Yeah, yeah. But there are several other sites. I mean, one of the things you can do is um, use it for YouTube, which is great, so you don't have to read. The only thing I wish they had was Facebook. You still have to upload to Facebook separately. Uh, there's no IEPI to get stuff on the Facebook, which unfortunately is important. That's one of the places you really want your stuff. Well, I think Two Mobile does have. Do they? I, I have I mean, used Facebook it. support now. I'm pretty sure I saw. Well, that. they'll send a oh, message. Exactly. They won't upload the videos. Okay. Yeah, that's what I want to. Do. Well, but yes, because you're, you're talking to upload it to your profile then, right? Or are you talking? I wanted to put it in my video area on my Facebook site. Okay, but that's within your profile, not on a fan page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can do it. You can actually upload videos to a fan page too. But not to not, not through any programmable interface, no. And you can't even upload to your profile page from TubeMogul. Right. There's just no API to, to do external video uploads, unfortunately. Um, but, but yeah, so you do want to expose yourself. So you get the added advantage by hosting. Because the initial thought was, wow, why don't, I, don't want to put, I don't want them handling my videos. It's like, well, actually, there's a big advantage to it. One, you, it eases up the work on you. Two, mm, there's all now, now you're exposed to a whole new fan base on a site out there, so that's an added advantage too. So it really didn't make sense to host stuff locally. The other problem I ran into, at least in the early days, and I think still now, if you put a raw video file like an M4V on your site, about half the people aren't going to be able to see it. Uh, Windows has a notorious thing, and if you, you click on a, a, a video link or even an audio link, it just stop, it, do, it doesn't look like it's doing anything because it's downloading the entire file before it'll play the first frame or the first note. And most of my clients go, it's not doing anything. And you look at the status bar and you go, well, actually it is. <laughs> it's downloading it all. And, it, and it's, that's not something that's under your control. It's totally a configuration on the PC. And so that was another frustration that I ran into was there was no constant way. You, you couldn't make a stable customer experience out of just having a raw video file there because it depended entirely on their machine how it would play. On a Mac, you click it, pops up a little QuickTime player. Okay, that works. But then, then you run into, you don't have the current version of QuickTime or stuff like that. Where with a Flash player, you know, it just it's pretty much click and go. 
And if, it, if they don't have the flash, if you don't have flash or don't have the right version, it asks them, you need to get the, you know, tell them there's, there's a path there to resolve the issue. What I would do is, is create the video, put it on YouTube, put it across all the other sites with Traffic Geyser and Tubo. Mm -hmm. So I get them all. all Traffic Geyser, that's, that's the other one. I couldn't yeah. remember the name, but yeah. Then I take the embed code from YouTube and I put it into my blog. So that works beautifully. If you're doing short videos, see, the thing that gets me about YouTube is I hate that 10 minute limit. Because yeah. for today, this well, is going to be a 45 like, minute talk. More or less like little tips and tricks yeah. that the are basically. The tips I use, you know, that's the nice thing is with the tips, they're only two to three minutes max. Right. So I can use two modes and go, blop, right. and they're out. And I know they're going to go on every site because I'm, I'm under that 10 minute limitation. But for something like today, you know, if I want to put it on the site, I got to break it up. I, I hate having to chop things into 10 minute bits. It's just a pain in the butt. It's, you know, quad triple, quadruple, quintuple the amount of rendering time out of Final Cut or out of iMovie, like, ah. Is this really worth my time? Um, so that's one reason that YouTube, I just kind of, I have a channel on YouTube. I've actually customized my channel. And I, Blip actually has a nice channel too. If you set up with them, um, they have, you know, douglaswelch.blip.tv. And it's actually a nice player with a, you know, it starts playing the current video and then it has all the v videos in reverse order on the right. And it will just actually play like a channel. It'll just go from one to the other. So that's, it's sort of nice. I don't really use it very much. But again, without any website, without any, <laughs> Anything else, you could actually start video blogging today. You could set up a Blip account and go. Okay, so then the question I have though, so I, I put this up to everywhere, but now I want to create the, the podcast, the RSS feed. So then I have to take that same video though, and I still have to host it. If, yeah, if you, well, no, 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 well, well, see, that's, that's in, not in my case because Blip will host and serve out that podcast ready file for me. That's one of the reasons I twist over to them. They, because I uploaded an M4V, they actually hold it on their site, okay. and I get a link, and I can link what to it for that? free. It's free. Yep. No, nope. that's for. They have a premium service. Right now we, we, we're doing an educational uh, program, and we have classes on there. There's a lot of them are like two hours long, but we host them ourselves because it's a members-only yeah. site. Well, well, if it's members-only, then you have the issues of qualification and stuff like that. Right. But um, you know, everything I do is public. The, the free stuff, obviously, I could put there. But is there an advantage to that over hosting it myself? Because you have to do the same thing, don't you? Because then you got to create the the link to it. You got to create the RSS feed. For it. No, no, because what what I'll tell you, if you look at my uh, my sites that have video, and you'll see basically uh, from Blip. Well, the nice there was also another advantage of Blip I didn't mention is I get the I get the one touch player, and the other the other thing here on this is. I can customize this to have my lo my URL in the corner, whatever colors. I, you know, I can do some you know fairly basic customization on the player, and then on my site, what I do is I here's a blog post. I put the video. You know, I use the embed code that I've created here, put the embed code in, so I get the one to player, and then right underneath here, I just put a link that says iPod Ready Video, and that's a link to the original M4V file on Blip, and that gets picked up by FeedBurner. Subscribers hit it. <laughs> Sucks it right down from Blip. But it's a high quality M4V file that's iPod ready, goes on your iPod, your computer, whatever. So Blip TV is going to be better than hosting it myself. For me, again, it's a very personal choice. I want to know what the easiest part is. I, thing still I found this to be. Right well, see, the, the nice thing is you know, how are you doing your RSS? I'm, the only thing I got RSS feeds on right now is my blog itself. Right. And I did that through Feedburner. Did you know I seriously did that like two weeks ago. So and I'm that's, a real newbie when it comes to the RSS. Yeah. Stuff. That's. Know. That's why that line's there, because I'm using FeedBurner. Yeah. FeedBurner sees that M4V file and goes, ooh, that's a media file. <laughs> Enclosure with the link so that iTunes, whatever else, sees that FeedBurner feed, sees that enclosure, and downloads it automatically to the client's computer. But if I go to PowerPress, then would I still put that in? No, because what you'll do is in PowerPress, on the PowerPress page, when you're, when you're doing a blog post in WordPress, down here you get a little thing that says, you know, podcast. And in there, there's a, there's a box where you put in that URL. You put the link in, but because PowerPress is generating your RSS for you, you just do it in a slightly different way. FeedBurner picks it up. URL will be then to the Blip TV. To the Blip TV, right, right. Now, I will say, I want to be up front, yes, you're depending on a third party to do this. In my case, it's been very stable. It has eased my workload a lot, because I can just basically upload it once, I get everything I need for my blog and my podcast, and I'm done. You know, so I saw it as a great advantage to be able to do that.
But if I hosted it myself, I can still use the power print. Yeah, you just put your you just put your you just put your local yeah, URL yeah, in here. Yeah. Yeah. The one touch player is what really, you know, that because as I said, trying to get it you can get flash players you put on your website, but I just have a bear of a time configuring them. Uh, well, we got like six they actually have flash players now too, don't they? That's right. Tasia and for, for our educational side of it, mm -hmm. and it builds a beautiful player and it loads like that. We're doing two hour long movies. So you're using the built in, you're, it's building the player for you. So again, if something is building, the whole point is to get the, something to build the player for you <laughs> so that you don't have to go through that hassle. You haven't used Camtasia. I have, I have. I've, there's a few. Uh, there's a few screencasts, because uh, I teach uh, podcasting and new media for writers at UCLA Extension. We do a 10-week course online, or last, the last time we did it, we actually we had a request from a bunch of locals. We did a one-day, eight-hour <laughs> session of it. Uh, we didn't get into the, it, on the on, in the online class, we get more into the, what, do you, what show do you want to create? Having them write a proposal. You know, you, we work a little bit more on the writing on the online course, we have more time. But the, uh, the workshop was basically a, a hardcore, Beginning to end, this is how you do a podcast <laughs> type of stuff. Um, but um, I have I made a lot of screencasts for that because of course I had to give demos. Well, how do you give demos if you're doing an online course? Well, you make a screencast, and so yeah, I use Camtasia for a lot of those. I used uh, I see I I see you I guess for the no was it I show you for the map to, to record some. Um, the, the real trick with Camtasia when you're uploading it, you're storing it yourself, you get it to, to load in any reasonable amount of time is to make sure you break it up into a table of contents with your markers. Break it up into like you know, little five, ten minute bits. So we can do a two hour movie right. and you break it up into 20 minutes. Yeah, I never do anything that long. <laughs> I, do, I do separate videos for stuff like that. Here's, here's, a, here's a GarageBand demo. Here's how to set your MP3 tags. Here's the other It's like by the time you get over there to click play, it's completely uploaded the entire cool. thing. Yeah, Camtasia is pretty nice. And now they have a Mac version too, so uh, that helps. <laughs> I just won that this morning. Woot! I think that I won Cam. I, I actually I won I, I won my version of Camtasia here. I think year one. No, year one. I think I think it was the first year I actually won it. So that's PodCamp for the win. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I just kind of want to bounce. I mean, a lot of the feed burners or anything. Because I mean, I'm in it for the analytics and for I do a lot of SEO. So I mean, for clients, it's all about numbers for me. So well. The, uh, Google just announced, well, Google's just announced, though, they've finally taken the next step in that regard. FeedBurner just got integrated into analytics now. You can go into analytics and actually create custom reports now um, from your FeedBurner data. So you're not limited to just that, those, those FeedBurner stats we used to get in the web pages. Now you can actually tie it in analytics and use the power of the analytics. They just announced it while, I think, while I've been here. FeedBurner switched from like feeds.feedburner.com to like feeds2. Feed proxy. Dot google.com slash career. Right. Yeah. Screwed up a bunch of stuff when they actually purchased that company. Well, now it didn't hurt. I, I didn't lose any subscribers when they do that. They had redirects in place. Right. Um, so I got lucky in that regard. Because I actually I got screwed because I switched as part of the test. Yeah. And it toasted me. I lost my show for like a week yeah. and I kicked myself hard for doing that. Um, but. You know, things have settled down. I, that's what I said, though. Is, you know, I'm probably leaning towards, now that we have these tools like WordPress and PowerPress, it's like, yeah, that's probably the next move, is bringing everything back in-house. PowerPress is awesome. I've been talking to those guys for a long time. I actually got to go off of the, the other one when that guy didn't update it. The PodPress. Well, it, it didn't work with, with what, two... 2.6 or 7, yeah, it didn't work, and so that, I know that, and now it does, but I, PowerPress is just a little more finished. Are they coming out with another upgrade next week? 2.9 or something? Well, no, no, WordPress, I, my WordPress blogs need upgraded right now. It's 2.86, I think, is waiting for me. I, I didn't want to do it here at the conference. I'm like, I'd rather do it at home. Well, you know, the automatic upgrade, I was actually using a plugin for automatic upgrades before that was great, and now it's built in, and it's like, click, okay, I'm done. It, I knock on whatever it's then flawless. The plug-in upgrades are flawless. I really haven't had an issue. So. The other day, they are coming out with a nice new feature. Did you hear that? They're finally putting in an undo button. An undo button. Well, they have a trash function now. So. Yeah, you don't, when you delete something, it doesn't just <laughs> go into the ether. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? We're coming down to the end of our time today? That's great. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.